This is the panel on competition policy in the telecommunications space. And we have two commissioners, the Federal Trade Commission, the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, we have a professor, Professor Yu of Pennsylvania, uh, and Gene Kimmelman, president of public knowledge. Uh, they are lined up in the sequence that they agreed on to speak. Uh, and uh, some may speak from their chairs, and some may speak from here. Uh, the hope is that they will speak somewhere between five and 10 minutes each, leaving us plenty of time for uh, internecine warfare and questions from you. Well, th thank you, Judge, and thank you to the Federalist Society for having me. Um, I'm delighted to be here to talk to you about net neutrality, one of my favorite topics, as well as how the FTC and antitrust law and consumer protection law should all fit together in this space. I'm currently a commissioner at the Federal Trade Commission, but my prior experience as the head of the Internet Access Task Force at the FTC, who issued a, a report on broadband connectivity competition policy in 2007, uh, actually uh, has in some ways much more relevance to this topic. Uh, and as I think about uh, these issues about competition in the telecommunications space, c a couple come to mind, uh, particularly uh, antitrust. What are the tools that antitrust can bring to bear in some of the kinds of concerns that people are raising in this, ish in this area about uh, lack of competition, about foreclosure, about the ability of a gatekeeper to, uh, to prevent um, other competitors in the marketplace or to reduce consumer choice. And uh, the way I look at it is I think the FTC has two very useful tools that it can bring to bear on these kinds of issues. First of all, uh, antitrust enforcement. So uh, the FTC uh, and the Department of Justice have you know, long brought enforcement actions against companies who are engaging in any competitive uh, practices or conduct in many, many areas, including uh, the telecommunications space. Now, I will say the FTC has a common carrier exemption, I'll return to that. So our uh, approaches have been limited, uh, our, our uh, authority has been limited uh, to reach certain, certain players in the market. But what are some of the benefits that an antitrust approach can bring to addressing these kinds of competitive and consumer concerns in the telecommunications market? First of all, um, I think we can give businesses and consumers um, a good amount of predictability and reliability and transparency in carrying out our enforcement mission. The uh, antitrust uh, issues have been long explored. They're very heavily influenced by economics, uh, overseen by the court system. Uh, there's a lot of scholarly research in this area. I think there's also a very good um, track record of a, a fairly quick resolution. I don't think the AT&T breakup necessarily is, is a, a good example of that. Uh, I think that went on a very long time, but maybe because it took a very regulatory approach to, to the breakup. But I do think an, antitrust can offer um, a, a quicker solution. One of the other benefits is um, expertise and procedural tools to develop an extensive uh, factual record quickly and efficiently. What we're looking at is, is there a harm occurring in the market or likely to occur? And that's very fact-based and very fact-specific. Because I think one of the real challenges in trying to have prescriptive regulation that's forward-looking is the difficulty, uh, it's really a knowledge problem. Um, Hayek would talk about it in those terms. Do you have, does the enforcer or the regulator have the information at hand about what's really occurring in the marketplace. It's very hard to predict the future. It's very hard to foresee problems that may arise or uh, good things that uh, an overly restrictive approach might shut off. And so an, a, a fact-specific case-by-case enforcement method, I think, has uh, great advantages. Um, one of the other issues is it, heavily influenced by economics. That's a very, very important part of antitrust analysis these days, and one of the issues uh, that we have in these kinds of markets, particularly the broadband market, that we need to get a good understanding of is that it's a two-sided market. And, and what, is that, what does that mean? What is the impact that that may have? Uh, some of you may be, two-sided markets are very hot these days. Jean Terrell just won the Nobel Prize in economics for his observations on this. 
But, but what is important uh, about understanding this is a two-sided market here that we need to proceed with care? Uh, it's because whatever solution or um, restriction is adopted can have important effects on the other side of the market. And if you don't understand how these two sides of the market are interrelated, you can have the kinds of uh, approaches or restrictions that uh, on balance make consumers worse off. Uh, one of the other things that I want to mention is our Consumer Protection Authority. So that you may be aware that the FTC recently brought an enforcement action against AT&T. It's in active litigation, so I'll just tell you what was said in the complaint, which is that AT&T had promised wireless um, subscribers for uh, internet service uh, unlimited, unlimited access. Uh, and then it engaged in, in throttling uh, of uh, access for those consumers. So the FTC brought a consumer protection action based on our deception authority and also our unfairness authority, but primarily our deception authority, saying that if a company has promised a certain level of broadband service and they don't provide that level, that's a fairly straightforward <coughs> consumer protection enforcement action that the FTC can bring. So to, to bring this all back to some of the debate that's going on today about um, a net neutrality, uh, one of the issues that I uh, want to bring to, uh, to the fore, and it hasn't gotten that much attention, is the fact I mentioned the FTC is a common carrier exemption. So we can't bring an enforcement action against a common carrier providing common carrier services. Right now, broadband has not been classified as a common carrier service. So, for example, we were able to bring the, a the action against AT&T. If broadband is reclassified as a Title II service, that is very likely to oust the FTC's jurisdi jurisdiction over these kinds of practices. And um, so I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about it on the consumer protection side as well as on the antitrust side. And um, for example, uh, the part of the net neutrality, uh, the, the previous open internet order that has been upheld, was upheld by, by the DC Circuit, is a transparency requirement. So, Broadband providers right now have to give consumers information about how they manage traffic, and they, that's a promise that they make to consumers. If they don't adhere to that, right now the FTC could bring an enforcement action against them, much like we brought one against AT&T in the throttling case. So one of the concerns that I have in this whole debate is the idea of losing the ability of the FTC to act as an enforcer on both the antitrust and the consumer protection side in pursuit of you know, some other values uh, through a, a regulatory approach that I'm not sure that losing the FTC's authority to act in this area will on balance make consumers better off given our activities, given our enforcement approaches, and given the tools that we have to bring to bear on these issues on both the uh, antitrust and the consumer protection front. So uh, I'll stop there and look forward to the debate. Thank you so much. I, I um, hope you will forgive me. I'm going to stay uh, tied to my written script. Uh, given the sensitivities of everything happening right now, I think it's best if I, I don't go off the cuff uh, with, with anything being said. So I hope you'll forgive me on that point, and I'm happy to answer any questions as we go along. Um, I want to start by thanking the Federalist Society for having me and the opportunity to participate uh, with such distinguished guests. Before I begin, I should mention that I intend to keep my comments rather general so as not to address any particular item or situation presently before the Federal Communications Commission. Moreover, as a practice, I do not comment on public or publicly comment on pending or potential mergers. So if uh, people have questions on those issues, I'm bound to punt on them later on. Similar to uh, our fellow uh, agency, as ably represented by my good friend, Commissioner Olhausen, part of the Federal Communications Commission's mission is focused on competition. In particular, the commission focuses on competition within the telecommunications space and more broadly, the overall communication marketplace. Unlike the FTC, however, the FCC has a much different regulatory paradigm resulting from a vastly different statutory construct. Practitioners of communication policy 
know that almost all authority provided by Congress to the FCC is contained in the Communications Act of 1934. From this statute, the commission is structured to be a proactive oversight agency as opposed to adhering to an antitrust model. For good or bad, this means that the provisions in the statute provide the commission with authority to respond to circumstances or conditions in the market or to preempt circumstances that may happen. From a historical perspective, the concepts of comp competitive markets and competition within the communication space are relatively a new phenomenon with the life of the, in the life of the communications policy. It is only within the last 30 years of the last of, of the overall 130 year or so history that today's vision of competition rather than monopoly created policy has garnered the focus and attention of legislators and regulators. This emphasis was solidified as one of the cornerstones of the landmark Telecommunications Act of 1996, which enacted an, uh, a number of deregulatory uh, measures and operated numerous market segments uh, to competitive forces where only government sanctioned monopolies previously existed. By rejecting artificial monopolies and embracing competition, the Telecom Act also provided the Commission with authority to prevent some private actors from engaging in certain practices that would harm competition. Separately, the Commission often uses its longstanding merger authority to consider and impose conditions on parties to transactions, regularly couching these conditions under a pro-competitive banner. These statutory provisions, including Section 214A and 310D, authorize the Commission to approve or reject the transfer of communications licenses between parties. In order to obtain Commission approval to complete a merger or license sale, the parties traditionally have been required to show how a particular transfer would meet the so-called public interest, which has proven over time to be a moving subjective target. To be clear, Competition-related provisions in the statute do not necessarily always induce additional regulations, but can lead to the deregulatory actions as well. For instance, Section 10 of the Communications Act is added by the Telecom Act, establishes a forbearance process to exclude any regulation from applying to a particular carrier or telecommunications service or class thereof under certain conditions. In fact, in considering whether to approve a forbearance petition, the Commission is required to consider whether doing so will promote competitive market conditions, including the extent to which such forbearance will enhance com competition among providers of telecommunications services. There have been multiple debates and criticism over the application of this provision by the Commission since its enactment. Recently, the Commission determinations have effectively narrowed the existing forbearance authority and expanded the scrutiny of most applications to the point of undermining its ability, its utility, excuse me. Overall, the exercise of the Commission's authority is subject to findings about the conditions in the marketplace. Since the advent of competition-centered policy, the Commission has tended to refrain from imposing new regulations or to withdraw existing regulations where a market or market segment is competitive, that is, there has been an inverse relationship between competition and regulation. As competition within a communication market segment increases, the necessity of regulation decreases, and consumers, whether commercial or retail, are able to move to other providers for the same or similar product or service. This light touch regulatory approach has been the relative norm for a number of years and helped produce a sound economic growth, a sound economic growth generated by the communications industry. Lately, however, the Commission seems to be turning its back on this approach by imposing regulations even in competitive markets. In general, many of the communications market segments in the United States are experiencing fairly significant levels of competition. While critics always seek more, this must be balanced with the high capital and labor costs required in this sector to operate and compete effectively. The limitations of the Commission's authority over, uh, statutory oversight authority arguably rest at the door, at the front door of the Internet. Despite what some people suggest, the statute provides limited authority to the Commission to oversee or regulate the Internet backbone, networks, or applications and services. Accordingly, the Commission has declined in the past to subsume the Internet in the bowels of the Communications Act. Recently, I've started to see the prior decisions, the ones that have allowed the internet to flourish 
absent government mandates and involvement become the subject of the Commission's rethinking process. I am a fervent believer of competitive forces uh, instead of imposing regulatory mandates or burdens, whereas real, stable, and lasting competition can tend to lead to lower prices for consumers, increased economic efficiencies, greater productivity, and advances in product and service offerings, regulations carry with them added costs, unintended and sometimes unforeseen consequences, lost productivity, and dead weight. Moreover, regulations interfere with the free market system, steering consumers and providers in directions that can be detrimental to innovation and the development of future marketplace. It is not an understatement to acknowledge that each regulation changes the path of communications history by some degree. I find the argument that you cannot have initial competition without the imposition of regulation to be completely fictitious. Think of the multiple internet, email, and text offerings that compete today without the imposition of any direct regulation. I also subscribe to the premise that government entities do not actually create markets or competition, except in the extremely problematic event when a government enters the field as a participant. Even in the most positive light, governments can, at best, create an atmosphere or an environment for competition by private entities who are willing to put capital at risk, put their financial future at risk, put their employees' future at risk, and much more to generate a product or service. Detrimentally, some governments, however, exert their power to bolster existing market players, often under the guise of preserving competition from market forces such as bankruptcy, liquidation, or consolidation. With that framework outlined, I'm prepared to cede the podium to the next presenter. I'm actually going to present from my chairs because I can't see them either. So, from there. Um, so I'm delighted to be here, and I'm going to take this in a slightly different direction. I thank uh, Judge Williams uh, for doing such a great job, and for Commissioners Oldhausen and O'Reilly for setting up this discussion so well. Um, I'm going to actually show some data on competition. You know, and what I love about uh, working in policy is there's nothing like a good fact in data because in the absence of data, people are free to argue their politics or their business model or whatever they can do uh, because they're, they're, you are unconstrained by reality and facts. And I always uh, find that uh, environment in what, the most problematic in which to do policy. Uh, the second thing I'll say about data is every piece of data I will show you, uh, people will quibble with because no collection methodology is perfect. Uh, I do think that if the alternative is no data, I still have concerns about that, but you know, I think that we should acknowledge that there are imperfections of data, but um, I'm gonna try to use them, for example, to show trend, which with imperfection still actually can give you some decent information. And I'll also point out all this data was collected either the, by the EU government or mostly by the FCC, and most importantly by the NTIA mapping project. So this is a process in which the public participated uh, under the Obama administration. This is part of the, the, the stimulus package. It was done by a lot of public servants working in very good will and it is a best effort, so I, and many of the objections I hear people raise were actually raised to, in the process and shot down and rejected. So I mean, even if there are people who would disagree the way they were resolved, there's a lot, I don't think we can attribute that to bad faith or a special interest or corporate interest. These were government officials attempting to do their job as well as they could see fit. Okay, so the first thing that, I will always, that we always hear in this space is that uh, we have a duopoly a fixed line duopoly. And I actually have two qualms with that. One is that, interestingly, um, uh, wireless has become a more and more important platform, and that, in fact, any projection you see uh, into the future has fixed line flat and wireless going uh, consistently upwards. And I understand we have spectrum crunch problems, but there are, that's what everyone in the industry seems to think. I actually think we should consider wireless, uh, but even if not, uh, I'm gonna show you numbers that are fixed line only, so we can actually get an assessment of what is the level of competition in the US. And in fact, the first set of numbers I'm gonna show you are FCC data. The fastest tier they crack is 10 megabits per second, and this is the one reported in what they call the Form 47, 477 data. And I'll just put it, I trended it based on how far back they tracked on uh, what, what the competitive status is. So this is data about uh, the percentage of households located in census tracts 
with 10 megabits of service provided by three or more providers. Uh, this is FCC is done on a semi-annual basis, and what we see is consistently in the, for through 2011, we had a very, very low level of competition, and there was only up to 2% of the actors had, uh, uh, households had uh, live-in sets of tracks with uh, three or more providers. Uh, since too late 2011, what we see is a pretty dramatic change. Uh, certainly at the 10 megabit through any technology, you have it going up to, to 93% by the end end of this 2013, which is the most recent data we have. But, and, and I think with LTE coming on right now, it offers average of 15 megabits of service peaking at 50 to 60. It's actually a pretty reasonable service for a lot of uses. Even if you just look at fixed line, 65% of American households are in census tracts where there are three or more providers. And so the idea that there's a duopoly, I would say that, um, is this as competitive a world as we'd like? No. Uh, this isn't, the nature of the industry is that it will never be that way. But I would say that, say that there's a, a general duopoly problem in the U.S. is not supported by the FCC's data. Uh, the, the best data I know of is actually the NTIA mapping study. This is done at the census tract level. Just because there's a service in the census tract doesn't mean the entire census tract is served. The most cons conscientious effort to do this is the NTIA mapping study, which is done at the census block level, which is city block by city block. Um, I don't have speed data for this. I only have total coverage data. And, uh, but again, the numbers are pretty interesting. What you start to see is uh, starting as of 2012 to the end of 2013, we see in the mid 50s there's some noise in the data that's moving around a little bit, but we see something over half of the American households live in a census block, that is a city block, that is served by three or more providers. And the, the general con concern that this is a, a, a duopoly problem, I actually think is, is a highly contestable part for at least, a question for at least half the country, because it seems that 55% of households have three or more providers, or live in a census block that have three or more providers. So the other thing we often hear, and, and a big part of what I've done lately is, uh, a US-EU comparison. It was motivated by articles I see in the New York Times and every place saying uh, we're behind Europe and therefore we should have a policy, that, a competition policy that looks more like Europe's, that focuses on service-based competition based primarily on bundling instead of facilities-based competition. And frankly, the way to put it in, in terms of uh, some little issue that's come up in the news of late, uh, they regulate the internet under the regulatory regime that governs the telephone system. And so an interesting study and a, uh, a real-world comparison is, so what happens when you regulate the internet under the regulatory regime developed to govern the telephone system? And what you discover is the numbers aren't very good, is that you discover that this is a 25 megabit coverage service. We only have two different levels. The other level is 200 megabit service where basically both the US and the EU have 99.5% coverage because that's all DSL and it's not very enlightening. This is the other one, 25 megabits. I, there's some risk about being the blind man looking under the light for his keys because that's where the light, uh, the dark, uh, dark at the dark. That's the only place we have data, but this seems to be what people are buying. So it's a legitimate, it seems to be validated by the data, by the actual behavior. And what you see is the, US, the EU has been trailing consistently for the last three years by pretty significant margins in the number of households that have um, service. So if you go to Germany, for example, the average speed in Germany is six megabits per second because they're basically a DSL, first generation DSL country. Um, the, the problems get even worse in rural areas. Uh, what you start to see is that, in fact, our, we've, we now crossed the 51% threshold, and we have uh, well, almost a two and a half, it was a four times advantage, but a two and a half times advantage in rural areas because of a, a more heterogeneous idea of the technologies made to serve. Um, if you look at fiber, where they often point to Europe as a fiber leader, um, if you take Europe as a whole, that's actually simply not true. They also see in these numbers tremendous heterogeneity. The best fiber countries in Europe are Lithuania, Latvia, and Romania. Why? Their copper coverage, their DSL coverage was about 30%. And so they had to dig a trench for something, and if you're going to dig a trench for something, you're going to put in fiber. Uh, so, in other words, if you had a failed telephone system, that might very well be the um, way to go. What's fascinating to me is Germany and the UK are on DSL-only strategies. Their fiber build-out is about 1%, 3%. They're using VDSL and trying to get 50 megabits to as many people as they can. And there's a wonderful quote I said, uh, you got a choice. You can get um, 100 gigabit service to 20% of your population or 50 megabit service to 80%. Uh, especially when the people who would get the gigabit service already have the best service in the country. And this is sort of an interesting policy question, and uh, I'm happy to talk about that as well. Um, LTE coverage, the U.S. has gone uh, much faster through a lot of spectrum policy issues, but some competition policy issues. The U.S. number is 95%. That's only one provider. I actually don't, the CMRS report has not come out yet, which actually gives us updated data, but I think no one will question that we're actually far ahead. 
And then I did a regression. Now, this is a little bit risky because I only had 55 data points in the EU. I used a proxy for service-based competition, a proxy for facilities-based competition. Um, I can do a lot of talking about this, but I don't want to go on about it. Bottom line, uh, service-based competition is statistically significantly negatively correlated with uh, 25 megabit build-out. Uh, facilities-based competition is strongly positively correlated. And uh, there's a bunch of controls and a bunch of fancy stuff I can talk about in the Q&A if you want to get into this. Um, the other number that shows up dramatically investment per household. So there was some robustness checks I did. Consistently since 2007, the US, has invest, US companies invested two to two and a half times more in broadband than their uh, European counterparts have. This is largely uh, an artifact of their getting lower revenue. Actually, EU providers' revenues has been declining throughout this period, which is a bit of a shock to me uh, because of the increase in utilization. And this is uh, actually a tremendous uh, validation of some of the underlying problems. And what's also fascinating to me is despite all this, and you have to take into account anytime you see price Pricing data, uh, the U.S. uses 50 to the average U.S. user uses 50 to 60 percent more bandwidth, and so a lot of people get fascinated with download speeds. You know, what's good as a Ferrari if you never drive it? Really, the utilization comes from what an uh, engineer would call bandwidth delay product. It's not just the speed, but it's times its utilization. You get the total throughput, and in fact, we're getting we're using and getting a lot more value out of it. Uh, the last thing I would say is there's a lingering problem with adoption. Build-out rates trump adoption rates three to four times. And so the regulators often look at the supply side, let's deal with pricing, let's deal with build-outs, that's what we know, that's how we used to regulate. What we're discovering is there's a persistent problem that will continue to plague the country, that if we, even if we just keep building pi pipes. Uh, the data on the bottom is Pew Internet Study data that shows that, in fact, pricing and availability are not the most significant factors. My favorite one up here, and it's backed up by EU Ofcom studies and the like, there was an a study done by two FCC staffers and two people from a company called Connected Nation that's wiring Kentucky. It's a very small outfit really doing uh, great work in wiring the country. They actually did a survey of all the families. It's about one-third you know, of the families in the U.S. or households that have not subscribed to, day, to broadband and asked, why? And when I presented this last time, Tim Wu really ridiculed, well, if you want to live in a cave, if you're just ignorant or a Luddite, and my reaction is, these are real Americans. I mean, this is a real problem, and to, to say that they're misguided or somehow you know, is, I think is disrespectful to them, but also, frankly, not helpful. I mean, they have an issue. And what we discovered is, they discovered is two-thirds of them would not take it even if it were free. And what that tells you is that we have a value proposition problem we have to put on the table. And we're seeing a lot of different strategies like zero rating strategies, Facebook zero, Twitter zero, to try to hand it to grand elderly people and say, you can talk to your kids for free on this. There's some really innovative things going on there. And in fact, what I see is as a way that those kinds of innovations that don't look like what's done before can be critical for us to actually getting more people adopted, getting the benefits, but also making the space more competitive. And that's it. <coughs> talks twice as fast as other people. So he <laughs> should have been cut by 50%. Gee. Thank you, Judge William. Thank you to the Federalist Society for inviting me and to my colleagues for engaging this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to present a little uh, slightly different perspective um, that actually I think brings some of this together. Um, uh, and I, uh, I recognize that Commissioner O'Reilly couldn't speak to the specific issues in front of him, and I'm going to I'm going to try not to as well so that we don't have to ex-party this. <laughs> um, but um, I think that there's a lot of merit to antitrust enforcement, and I worked in the Justice Department on, on, on anti, in antitrust, and I think there's just tremendous benefit to it, but not to the exclusion of a lot of the work that the Federal Communications Commission does in and around broadband policy, and then more specifically net neutrality. Um, and I think it, the, my, my theme is, is that the critical issue here is how to harmonize split jurisdiction appropriately as Congress has uh, directed two, really three agencies, DOJ, FTC, and FCC, to engage appropriately, whether it's in a uh, transactional context or in uh, um, the behavior of individual or multiple companies in the marketplace. So I believe that the, the, the issues to look at are can there be consistency between antitrust enforcement and um, FCC uh, um, uh, uh, regulatory activity. Um, I believe there are ways to do it well and there are ways to do it not so well. But each, as you've heard today, um, is thoroughly engaged in competition analysis um, under s different statutory guidance. Um, but I see no reason why they cannot be generally consistent 
and harmonious. Um, for example, um, I think that in some cases, Commissioner Oldhausen is right, you can have quick antitrust enforcement. In some cases, it's not so fast. Um, I'd say it's not just the AT&T case, but it's uh, the FTC's Google investigation was quite lengthy and is in Europe is still going on. So there are issues there in um, innovative markets uh, where technology is changing quickly, where you can look at pros and cons of antitrust enforcement and um, pros and cons of also a case-by-case -case analysis. The benefit may be that you're very fact-specific. The difficulty may be that if you are a uh, innovator uh, with a new service in a garage that's having trouble getting access to the internet or speeds or quality, um, the time it takes to do the case-by-case -case analysis may not be beneficial to you ever reaching the market or sustaining your business. Uh, which is not to say that regulation is fast. Um, but one of the benefits of an appropriate regulatory model might be, a structural regulatory model, might be to send very clear signals and very strong signals to the marketplace of what is acceptable behavior, what is prohibited behavior, um, and how things in the middle could be balanced. Um, not so much as if the regulatory process itself necessarily moves quickly, but that the signals to the marketplace actually work effectively to indicate what behavior to watch out for and what is almost invariably green-lighted. Um, and I'm not sure the fact that something is a two-sided market uh, changes the matter that much if the regulatory process is being done appropriately and thoughtfully, because surely it should consider all the ramifications, not just to the user side, but to the supply side um, in any regulatory paradigm. Um, I fully understand the need to worry about jurisdiction, and I think that uh, uh, what we ought to be most concerned about societally is that we're not duplicating regulation and we're not promoting inconsistent rules and enforcement practices, but I'm not so sure it matters whether it's done at one agency or another if they're uh, practicing sound uh, uh, policy and being very straightforward and subject to judicial review, as each of these agencies is. Now, I think that um, I really appreciate Commissioner Riley highlighting the FCC focus on competition. One of the things that has jumped out to me over the years in looking at the transactional side of this, where, whether it's DOJ, FTC, looking at mergers and, and uh, acquisitions, or um, uh, the FCC, is that in areas where there may be limited competition going in, there are some interesting statutory limitations that can apply. Um, if you're not dealing with a, mono a straight monopolization case in antitrust, you might be looking at a market that is highly concentrated, even possibly monopolistic. And the discussion with the antitrust enforcement agency of overcharging consumers, harming innovation might be, is this transaction making it worse? That is most likely what the conversation will be. And if it's already substantially bad and the market isn't working competitively, um, I have experienced many times my friends in antitrust say, you have a problem, but it's not our problem. Go over there, which for this industry is the FCC. Because within their statutory mandate, however vague the public interest may be, Congress has specifically directed the FCC to look to actually promote competition. And that is something that can be difficult in some instances in pure antitrust enforcement. So from my perspective, the ideal would be harmonizing the tasks of the two functions within our government and making sure that what is being done in antitrust enforcement is consistent with what is being done in regulatory policy or reviewing transactions, license transfers at the FCC, where the FCC might actually be able to do something that can actually open a market to more competition. Um, I also totally agree with uh, Commissioner O'Reilly that the, the goal should really be um, to, to seek competitive forces um, and not use regulation as a tool to, for, uh, or, or a surrogate for competition, where it certainly doesn't always or often doesn't promote that. However, then we get into the factual analysis of, well, what does the market look like? Um, and I, I think Professor Yu's data are interesting. I'd like to, re to review them.
Um, but it does remind me a little bit, Chris, of the history of when we did in the early 20th century have a lot of companies trying to come in and compete in what we call telephone service. And it didn't really work economically. So I don't know if we're hitting a plateau or if you're on some great ascendancy for broadband. Also would love to see your 10 megabits numbers put into the 25 megabits range just to see what happened. We just released a survey today at Public Knowledge, John Horrigan did, looking at um, the different side of this, the consumer attitudes, and uh, which is on, on our website and available. But uh, the, the, short, um, the short headline is that when we ask people would you use wireless as a substitute for wireline broadband? More than 90% said no. Um, and uh, on the questions related to how easy or difficult it is to switch broadband service, consumers were profoundly um, concerned that it was not at all easy, that there was an enormous amount of stickiness, you know, whether there is one other provider or two. So some important issues there on substitutability and how markets really work that you know, I would love you to look at um, in, con in conjunction with your data. But what we see right now, from my perspective, is that as much as we would love competition, as well as much as we would love more players, there are problems in broadband that do need public oversight. And from my perspective, we ought to be looking at how to use antitrust appropriately in conjunction with communications policy oversight and just make sure they are consistent and truly harmonized. Perhaps uh, speakers would like to take issue with, she, with each other. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy to start off just uh, because uh, Jean um, directed the last comment towards me. And so I always appreciate talking with Jean just because I think you're very thoughtful. And I find that you know a lot of times in this space, people talk past each other. And I think that you've always engaged in a constructive sort of way. It is true that we saw a spate of voice competition uh, once uh, following the 96 Act that fell off. Uh, that was all based on the infrastructure sharing model that Europe largely follows today. And it wasn't robust. It was all reselling someone else's pipe. And uh, there are a lot of us who've been skeptical about that. I mean, uh, Herb Hovenkamp has a great article. It's like saying, oh, we're going to have competition for bananas within a grocery store. We're going to have all these banana carts running around the store. They all get the same bananas from the same wholesale place in the back. Uh, the same product, and all they're doing is squeezing margin. And frankly, if you have a monopoly pipe that really that's all you're going to get, that's not an unreasonable policy to adopt. We're in a different space now where we're having to do investment. You know, for voice in particular, wireless, I mean, you've seen what's happened with, with you know, fixed line subscriptions. They're dropping like a stone, and none of my students have them anymore. And so one of the things that we've understood, and certainly in the voice space, the facilities-based competition ended up being a wonderful solution that became much more robust. I understand Gene's skepticism about uh, the future of wireless. I do see a lot of numbers pointing that way. Uh, interestingly, a survey that was published to present at a TPRC is that 11% of U.S. households are now wireless only for broadband. Uh, some countries in Europe are in excess of 20%. And if you look at the numbers, um, well, I guess what I would say is it's plausible to me that this would happen. And I find so many people ta doing what I think of as technologically determined views, oh, this can't happen or this must happen. And anyone who's followed this business long enough knows that that's a good way to go broke. Because a lot of things that we thought were so sure, I mean, we talked about the fiber, impending fiber monopoly for a while. And then we're talking about the impending cable monopoly. And now, right now, where AT&T is upgraded to VDSL, they're taking subscribers away from cable. And actually, I think that's what's wonderful about this, is we don't really know. I do see, actually, a lot of my students don't have fixed line connections anymore, and are doing it. Um, I always keep an eye on them, because they're a trend of where things are going. But my point is, one of the brilliant things of the US policy is we're flexible. And when I started in this business 15 years ago, AT&T was doing Uverse when Verizon was doing Fios. And one of my students said, isn't AT&T being incredibly short-sighted? And I said, well, the great thing is we get to find out. You know, and that's a, an environment in which we have that kind of experimentation. I think looking back, what they would say is Verizon doesn't talk about Fios anymore. And that uh, 18, it costs th two and a half, three times more, or three and a half times more. And so it's a wonderful experiment that we're still, that Europe is repeating. I, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to bash AT&T. Verizon did the same bet on LTE when AT&T wasn't ready to move and got a tremendous out of that. But this is equity risk, people putting their money on the table with major investments, and if, and if it pays off, that's how we drive it forward. And I want people trying to out-invest each other 
instead of trying to out-regulate each other by trying to get uh, some regime where they're trying to use the system to, to, the, to get a legal advantage as opposed to something in the marketplace. I neglected to say this at the beginning, but I should say it now, which is that I do only speak for myself. And not <laughs> the uh, but, uh, but I do think the discussion raises a, a couple of uh, interesting uh, issues. Um, uh, Jean, I think you're right that having a regulation in place is uh, quicker and more certain than a case-by-case -case enforcement approach. But I think the question there is, you have to look at type one and type two errors, right? What are you preventing? Uh, the bad things that you're preventing, but also what are some of the good things that you that you may be preventing. A and my concern is that uh, adopting a model, a regulatory model that freezes into place what the internet looks like right now is we don't know what we're miss what we're missing out on. And uh, I agree. Um, you know, competition I think is the first line of defense for consumers in. A uh, telecommunications policy as well as everywhere else in the economy. And I think we need to take a, a hard look at, at regulatory proposals to say, will it lead to more um, competition in networks? Uh, or will there be, impose a limit on how these networks can evolve? We've certainly seen a lot of competition, uh, a lot of innovation at the edge, um, and, and I think that's, that's a good thing. Uh, but I think um, we need to think hard about uh, innovation and competition in the networks as well. I, I'd be interested um, if I if I understood Gina, and without talking about anything specific or specific <laughs> item, <laughs> uh, if I understood your your points and I took them very well, uh, that that consistency and harmonization between the, the agencies that we represent is a good thing, and I wondered if you couldn't comment about the point that the commissioner made regarding the lack of authority that that if certain decisions are made that the FTC would have no authority in some items. And where do you, how does that fit with the consistency and harmonization of, you know, well, if, if the FCC um, has no authority in a space? I would worry if nobody has authority sure. over something that's important as either something directed by Congress or um, agencies to, to um, uh, um, oversee or something that we just think is important for society that we would hope the agencies would at least be cognizant of. So in this regard, if, if broadband were um, a Title II service, the FCC. Well, I didn't really say that, but yeah. I, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> if just hypothetically, um, I do believe the FCC has customer provider and network information uh, authority. Um, it has authority under Title VI over cable uh, um, privacy issues as well. Um, so there are a variety of things the FCC has. I think it'd be interesting to look and see what the actual um, dividing line w would be. Uh, but we also have, with you know, again, the same principle applies in antitrust. If you follow the line of the, the Trinco uh, case, as an example, uh, we're very careful to make sure that antitrust isn't inter interfering with a regulatory regime. And so I think using the same logic here, just again, consistency, harmonization. It's important to make sure that we have protections uh, for uh, for consumers. Um, from one of the agencies or the other, and that certainly we don't have both of them going in the opposite direction. So that, that's my main point here. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm pleased to see the FTC move on the, uh, the AT&T question of, of fairness in the presentation of its services. Uh, but uh, I also think that there are things the FCC could do if the FTC weren't doing them. And um, uh, I'm mostly worried to make sure that someone can do something. So it's interesting. So I love the idea of what the FTC is doing. Frankly, I mean, people should get what they're promised. <laughs> and I don't think anyone would dispute that and that there is, uh, there are problems. I mean, there have been problems. I'm not saying, without saying an opinion on this, and I'm glad that someone's doing that. And um, I agree entirely with uh, Gene that reducing switching costs makes markets work better. And I do think that there are, for example, number portability in the wireless space was tremendously successful. There are things we can do that can help with this. Um, what's fascinating in Europe, the inside wiring is almost owned by the incumbent provider, almost always owned by the incumbent provider. Uh, they're finding ways to use that. I mean, there's a lot of interesting things, access to conduits, things that do maintain non-competitive characteristics and are likely to. And so I think that there is a room for actually thinking, but I love the idea of framing it in terms of reducing switching costs and increasing competition, as Commissioner Olhausen said, in networks. Uh, 
where we don't, and not necessarily everywhere, but where we don't have enough competition in networks, which isn't everywhere. I mean, many metropolitan areas do have a workable level of competition. What bothers me about the debate is it's really motivated about preserving competition in uh, content and applications at the edge which is already very competitive and very open, unprotected by entry barriers, very likely to stay that way. And what's lost is, you know, we talk about, to the extent which we talk about the edge, we talk about the garage innovator, but really what's driving the bait is large companies, um, on edge providing companies, and in many ways who are, in my opinion, in a position to take care of themselves. And so I find in the, be the debate, where we have an edge concern that's legit, we very easily start off with that rhetoric or many companies in that space invoke that rhetoric and then slide into talking about, um, I want a better economic deal, uh, which is, should be an arm's length negotiation between two, good com two companies that are in a perfect position to take care of themselves. Questions from the floor. It's very hard for me to see, but I can. And there's also a microphone in the middle of the floor. So while you're pondering, I want to come back to Chris on the um, on the data issue. Um, sure. So what I was referring to was not just not really the the 96 Act, but really the early 19th century before the modern oh. AT&T monopoly emerged. We had a lot of phone companies. We did. It didn't really work. So as um, so there, there's yeah. some fundamental economics here that uh, at a certain point, I think um, you you mentioned e economies, uh, capital investment. I mean. Obviously, some big issues here. How many are we really going to get? So actually, um, like any good academic, I, I have the standard answer. I have an article on this. Um, <laughs> it came out in the Texas Law Review. I actually love this time because there's a, a second part of the story, which is many people don't know. We often say that we had a private phone system unlike the rest of the world. Actually, the U.S. Post the Postal Service took over the U.S. telephone system for one year during World War I. And it's something often lost to history. And the big question is not why they took it. The Postmaster generals have been wanting that for 50 years. Um, the, the question is, why did the federal government give it back? I mean, that's the interesting question. But happy to talk about that. But the competitive era in the early system is, in my opinion, a great example of what we should have, which is this unfettered race for the market. Uh, AT&T was trying to replicate the old telegraph system, connecting major business centers with long distance connections. They didn't even wire suburban New York. I mean, they just didn't. They say, why would anyone want a phone in their home? And they just missed the boat. And so this left this green field for all these independents to come in. And the funny thing is, we normally think of, oh, and they, they, they said farmers don't need phones. Farmers were the most desperate people for phones because they were the most isolated. They made phone systems by hooking wires up to their barbed wire fences and using any metal connection. Now this is, AT&T said, well, that's low quality. You'll never get a long distance connection over that. But 99% of connections were within 20 miles of your home. I mean, people didn't call long distance back then. And so what's fascinating is we saw this really robust environment where people missed the boat. And what you see in 1907 is a clear change in policy from AT&T. They said, um, we are going to merge to monopoly where possible that will buy out the independent we're competing with. Where they refuse, we'll do a division of markets, which is you stay where you are, we'll stop, we'll withdraw from your area as long as you promise, don't, promise not to grow. Two classic, blatantly anti-competitive things. Okay, and uh, that's what we sh that should have been blocked by an antitrust enforcement authority. But the question is, okay, if we withdraw competition, prices will go up. Because actually, it cost less to buy two connections in 1907 than it cost in the monopoly era to have one from AT&T. And you got 10 times the number of customers. So they said, OK, we will agree to rate regulation. So monopoly was not the justification for regulation. Regulation was the justification for monopoly. And it's an example of people use, a company using the political system and legal intervention to end competition in a very, very cynical way. And it's a fascinating story to me of some of the dangers where I love a world in which they're trying to, to outbuild each other. And I love what's happening right now in uh, between uh, ca cable companies and telephone companies with VDSL coming on. I l and that's how I'm hoping we generate structures where people are trying to create better products that make consumers happier. And that's a, a great way for us to drive this forward. Did I see it? Yeah. No? Yeah. Yes. Oh, you have a question. Good. Oh, you're going out right. I just want to say to Chris, I think your story is right, except one of the problems is that um, those competitive companies refuse to interconnect with each other. And it was that refusal. We could have possibly had a non-monopoly, totally competitive system if they could have either had a regulator just imposing meaningful interconnection rules or could have figured it out in the marketplace themselves. 
and that was an important factor in play, I think. Hi, uh, Howard Lim, New York State Conservative Party. Uh, th this administration uh, seems to enjoy doing things by executive order. In, in the area of net neutrality, uh, if the Congress wanted to go in one direction and the President wanted to go in another, where does the ultimate authority lie? Well, I'll, I'll t I'll, um, <laughs> I'm trying to be careful on my words here, only that I, you know, it, um, the FCC is an independent agency. And it is a creature and a creation of Congress to implement the laws and the statutes enacted by Congress. We will faithfully do that. That is my charge, and will continue to do so. Um, you know, the, the president has has an opportunity, and, and does, and, and you know, express his views from time to time, and presidents, you know, do. Um, and on many different f issues, not just in front of the FCC. So that's something we will certainly take into account. Um, and just like we would take into account what uh, you know comes from the Congress that's not in, a, in, in the form of a law. Uh, it doesn't probably answer any. <laughs> you, you, the, there's one thing that I think is worth noting that um, within the law right now, any regulation can be reviewed by Congress and there is actually a streamlined process for that. So if there were to be something done by the FCC that the Congress didn't like, it could um, reject it. That would then go to the president who would have to sign it as a bill or uh, veto it and then it would be the question whether the Congress would sustain or override that veto. So there is at least a process there by which one would naturally see a disagreement either worked out or just somehow resolved. Uh, I'll go even farther. Agencies are creatures of Congress. Uh, they have the authority given to them by Congress. There may be a prerogative executive authority regarding, you know, foreign affairs, military, national security, you know, commander-in-chief power and the like. You know, I've written on the removal power, some things to make an administration run, but um, dictating communications policy has never, to my knowledge, been asserted to be within the prerogative authority of the president. And so, um, you know, which isn't, you know, we've seen steel, see any number of things where presidents in, over the years have tried to expand it into commercial regulatory matters. And they've largely been rejected. And so there may be executive order authority the president may try to exercise. Uh, I think that a good court would be appropriately skeptical without uh, proper legislative author authorization. The, the president, of course, obviously has the power to appoint the commissioners initially. And I often read in the papers that uh, if some hypothetical commission does something that Congress doesn't like, it could uh, respond. Some hypothetical commission does something that Congress doesn't like, Congress could respond by some sort of selective withdrawal of funds. And I, I guess my, my intuitive reaction to that is the trouble is they always have to, uh, if they did it as a little stiletto, uh, the uh, president would pay no attention. If they wrap it together with something, then there's going to be, uh, you enter into the sort of uh, bargaining position that we've seen an awful lot in the last uh, few years, uh, which doesn't seem to, the, out the outcome of which is uncertain at any rate. That, but I'd be very interested in any reflections on that. Well, there's been a huge fight over the years about whether appropriations riders interfere with the executive power of the, the president. Uh, my favorite one is LBJ was given a rider where he couldn't close a dairy farm in Maryland, because it was in some members, important members district, and he said, I have authority over, it's a military dairy farm to explain, and he said, I have authority over the entire uh, US Armed Forces except for 20 cows in Maryland. And you know, there is a sense in which that, you know, it can be taken to absurd lengths. But um, the bottom line is, he complained about it, but he still uh, kept the farm open, so that's the nature of politics. But, and I only add to that, it's not just appropriations. I mean, uh, just to give you a historical perspective, there used to be seven FCC commissioners. So there's only five. What happened to the other yeah. two? <laughs> 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 well, the, 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 the slots scary. were removed, not the, 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 people, the people themselves are they I'm sure living somewhere <laughs> next to the farm. But, the, <laughs> but there's a Supreme Court case called U.S. versus Lovett, where a, a president didn't like the authority of an independent agency, tried to abolish, pull them, and reappoint new people, just do the old bait and switch. Supreme Court shut them down. Um, and, and speaking from a historical perspective, back in the 1970s, the FTC had done some work in something called KidVid, right, where it was going to restrict uh, advertising of uh, sugared cereals, and, and Congress uh, wasn't happy about that. 
and the number of tools that Congress could bring to bear on an agency uh, where Congress is not happy with them is, uh, is quite uh, remarkable. The FTC was um, shut down. Uh, the uh, people didn't get you know, salaries. Uh, the agency uh, staffing was reduced. Uh, there's a lot of tools that Congress can bring to bear. Yes. I'm Sam Miarelli. I'm in the Orlando Lawyers Chapter. Um, we hear a lot of the, the latest discussion is this, the battles of the different types of technology of you know, cable and whether we should have net neutrality and all. And I'm wondering uh, why we haven't heard more about uh, how these different players mess with the ultimate devices. You know, once upon a time, AT&T owned the phones and they regulated what the individual handset can do. And you still see that in the mobile space. Uh, you know, Verizon uh, notoriously delays Windows Phone updates going out. AT&T notoriously delays updates in Android going to Samsung devices longer than often going to Google devices. Um, and, and that really creates some, some large dislocations using those, those large monopoly powers in the marketplace for the end device that as a consumer you have to think 18 months from now, will my device get treated like a second or third or fourth class citizen by the carrier, regardless of what the device manufacturer tries to do. And I'm just wondering why it is we focus so much on the delivery of the data and, and we don't look at some of the broader issues that it doesn't matter how good my pipe is if my phone crashes. Commissioner Olhausen, do you want to take that? Seems like a competition. Sure, issue. sure. So um, I, I guess the, the question that I, I would have there is, um, how much of an incentive do the networks actually have uh, to, to do this? You, you may talk about, you know, this consumer uh, maybe just signed up for their phone and 18 months from now, but the amount of switching that goes on every month uh, it seems to me that it could likely have a disciplining factor on the ability of uh, one um, network, one provider to, um, to disadvantage a, a different type of phone. So you were saying that uh, the one network had an incentive to... Uh, the, and, and how, no. but how big a share of the market of Verizon is Windows phones? I mean, Windows phones have a very small market share, is my understanding. So this is, um, there's a lot of complicated issues with this. And there's like, um, wireless ISPs regard Windows updates as the biggest denial of service attack in the entire network. <laughs> because they all go on one night, I think it's Thursday night, and they just, they kill networks sometimes. You know, and so they have to do something because otherwise none of those updates will get through. And so they're in a very strange position uh, as far as updates go when they're going to lots and lots of customers. The second thing that's quite interesting to me that I've played around with which is that um, we forget how heterogeneous wireless technologies are. So one of the things that uh, people complained about the original exclusivity deal between the Apple iPhone and AT&T. Uh, AT&T was coming off one platform called HSPA+. Plus. Verizon uh, and uh, Sprint run EVDO. See, and interestingly, one of the things I talked to the Apple engineers, it was easier to deploy it, and they hadn't worked out all the bugs with EVDO. So it was possible, partly a business decision because of the technology. They just couldn't make it work yet. And what we're discovering is the way companies actually uh, are design their technologies makes certain things easier in terms of how you provision stuff out. The other weird thing that I've heard is that um, they, the network providers often need to work with the companies to actually to work on them to conserve bandwidth uh, and to ma manipulate the, what they're doing. The, the essential security patches go out first and all the nice, you know, glossy features come a little bit later. And what they often find is that um, other companies who are pushing stuff out aren't really willing to conserve on bandwidth and aren't willing to work with them to make what we end users really want, which is a safe phone first and you know updated in timely manner. Uh, you have to make some trade-offs, and what you find is there's often a very difficult negotiation about how they're going to hand off that data, when they're going to do it, uh, that in fact, and, and all the edge providers don't cooperate in the same manner. And so it ends up, if you can see, 
what looks like discrimination from one side can be simply what another side would regard as intransigence. And as a legal matter, someone has to go in and say, who's the liar? I mean, that's, that's a really, really tough position to put a, a matter in. So I'm hoping to get, you know, to try, my incentive, instinct would be to try to align incentives so that uh, people wouldn't have as much instinct to do that, to minimize the space of conflict. Uh, thank you. I came in late, but some of the earlier questions have given me the uh, confidence to ask this. I'll address it to Professor Yu since uh, you're free to give an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I dare say Gene's in the same position. Yeah, well, it, this gets worse because I work in the <laughs> stock market and I observed when President Obama made his comments about net neutrality, I mean, wow, it just crashed a whole bunch of big stocks. And that left me to attend this session and wonder what is, and I believe I saw you on television for this also, thank you very much. What is your interpretation of what President Obama was doing? I mean, does that funnel into something real practical that he can put his hands on? Or was he just making an expression, do you think, of his you know, desired policy for what he'd like to say? It was quite mystifying. Certainly destabilized I, yeah. that, you know, a whole bunch of companies and a lot of thought as to what competition policy currently is. So the, the example, you get to, before I answer the direct question, the fact that th your observation about the market reaction actually, I think, is an important one. Uh, but many people suggested that, oh, markets don't care about this stuff. Uh, uh, you know, it, the, and well, I've seen that statement made as don't worry what happens A or B. Uh, I, I think it matters, you know, and not just in terms of immediate market responses, but in a much bigger sense. I think, you know, I think Gene and I would agree, it matters. Um, and in fact, we should expect it to change stock prices. I mean, it's just, it, it, it matters at that level. Um, I am not a mind reader. Let me speculate. Okay. Uh, Senator and candidate and President Obama has repeatedly endorsed this as a principle. Um, uh, network neutrality, um, and in fact, he has been held by some people accountable to living up to those promises. Uh, a political explanation might be, in a world in which you are unlikely to get legislation through, uh, playing to a base is an excellent strategy. Uh, there are many Democratic members who are raising money around this. And it's not a universal thing, but some places it plays very well. And he may perceive, look at a stack of several million emails sent to the FC, to Mike's agency, to Mr. Morales' agency, and think there's a uh, political uh, high ground or a, a, pl a plausible high ground where I am on the side of all the people who did that. Third possibility. Um, to give cover to an agency by making something that look, would might have looked as intrusive look moderate in comparison. Um, it's been suggested to me. Um, I don't know how much I believe that, but that's a possibility as well. And um, it could simply be that uh, you've had some people in the White House study the issue and simply think on the merits, this is what they should, that this is the legal answer to do. And so um, there are plenty of people who disagree. Um, it's not entirely clear how this is going to play out in the agency because, as uh, Commissioner Riley points out, the FCC is an independent agency, and Chairman Wheeler's made very clear that he made it a point to remind everyone of that fact. Uh, but um, it will be very interesting. But why he chose to do it is, um, I assume, is uh, in terms of the politics, will make it more likely that that's the outcome. Because it's well known that the, I'm, I'm really um, not going uh, to, I'm not trying to put Commissioner O'Reilly on the spot, but there is a division in the commission, and it's not entirely clear how the chairman's going to get to three votes on his preferred proposal. And I would say that the president's announcement now makes that likely harder. Uh, and so my guess is that if the president was trying to get this as an outcome, uh, he's, it's quite likely that he had an impact on, uh, made it more likely that the Commission will do Title II. This, this relates, and I don't see it, unless someone has a question. I, oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, Baron Soka, Tech Freedom. Gene, a lot of what's driving this debate, a lot of the argument for Title II boils down to this assertion that you've made today that a 706 approach isn't workable to address concerns about discrimination because the 
administration of it would be just too difficult, be too burdensome for small providers. But there are many people, Hal Singer, for example, of the Progressive Policy Institute, has called for an approach where you would work through 706 and you could actually marry a uh, rule of reason with a presumption. So you could say as at the outset that uh, prioritization is presumed lawful, but you put place a fairly small burden on uh, websites or edge providers to show that, that there's a harm to them. And at that point, the uh, burden would shift to broadband providers to defend themselves. And that gets you a way of screening out frivolous complaints without making it so difficult for, uh, for edge companies, especially small companies, to raise their concerns. That's something that could be done under Section 706. Uh, it's something that's very consistent with where the Supreme Court came out in the activist decision, where the Ninth Circuit came out recently in another decision. What do you say to that? Are you open to such an approach? And if so, why do we need Title II? Why can't we do that under 706? Well, we said from the outset that the Commission should look to use all its tools and figure out which the best ones were, and, and that includes 706. And, and um, I, I think there's some interesting things that could be done with 706. There are also some things that could be way overreaching that would be much more regulatory than I think any of us would like. So one has to be a bit careful there. Um, my, my greatest concern, in all honesty, is that the history of the FCC in doing case-by-case -case analysis, which has not been in this area as much as in the media area, uh, with programming disputes. And um, uh, from my perspective, it's been, it's been a, 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 pretty, a pretty dismal history of very slow moving, uh, very contentious. Um, uh, and, and so it's not that it is implausible or impossible to do what you just described, Aaron. Um, it, it just, this is not the way that commission has functioned very well in the past. Um, uh, so from my perspective, one could, one could use Title II and one could use certain 706 tools, one could use a variety of tools. The critical thing is actually what Commissioner O'Reilly said is, you know, we should, be, we should be looking for something that's light-handed. This is a highly dynamic industry, a lot of technological changes, a lot of things moving as Chris's charts show. Um, and I think one should be cautious whatever the tools are and do it carefully. The question is whether you can come up with something that balances the right forces, sends the right signals to the marketplace, and actually avoids much reg regulatory intervention. And so I don't know whether 706 tools combined the way you just described them would actually work that way. I don't, I don't think it's impossible, but it, 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 it just, the, the, the history of the, of the FCC in dealing with case-by-case -case analysis is not a very good one. But there is a miss, I mean, you do have to have tools designed for the goals. And, and one thing that I organized a panel here about a month ago in which Mark Cooper spoke, and he said his, he doesn't support Title II, even though he's a strong network neutrality proponent, because he says Title II won't stop paid prioritization. I mean, you can always, in a, in a common carriage regime, have multiple classes of service that cost different amounts of money. And so what I find odd about the President's announcement is he said, uh, we need to ban paid prioritization. I understand why he feels that way. And we need to do this through Title II. I do think that even if that were your goals, there is a misfit between the tools and the goals. And I think that actually that there's actually some merit, you know, what, the way I often, the quick offhand way to do it is, I would pay for a better connection to my office and my email server and the places I go the most. That would make my connection better for me. And so I actually think that pay prioritization opens up new way, sources of consumer value uh, because we don't go to every place equally. But set that aside, even if you were convinced of another set of goals, I didn't quite see how the president's statement hung together all the way because it's not going to, he, had, he set out five things he wanted to, you know, to stop. Title II doesn't necessarily get you there. And I actually think that, I personally think Title I and 706 has more potential to be, uh, to accomplish the goals that the President has set out. And, and actually I have a, just sort of a question about paid prioritization, which is uh, the big edge players can already buy better delivery service through content delivery networks like a Akamai. Um, so, the, the idea that right now everything is exactly the same and everyone on the edge has the same, you know, uh, route and speed through the network, I, I don't even think is, is true right now. So uh, I'm a little um, uncertain of why uh, we're acting as if that's the case right now and we want to keep it that way. So I mean, the, US, the internet's made up of, is a network of networks and people forget what that means. If you look at the routing tables, there's 47,000 different autonomous systems that make up the internet. And they mostly 
bargain through arms length negotiations and different topologies and investments and links and all this. And it's, a, it's, it's how we build new capacity. It's how you, you get paid to do it and you do this around. The idea that two bits that of coming from similar sources to the same place would pay the same amount and take the same amount of time blinks reality. And, uh, and if we're going to get in the business of equalizing that instead of the way it works within networks, uh, you're going to see a fairly comprehensive regulation of all interconnection disputes. And, and what we all know is you get one price wrong. You're going to see a flood of traffic going through the mispriced link and then the natural thing would be to adjust a price in another direction to bring the market back into to clearance. You can't do that. And so one of the, the odder things is, is we have to think, as Professor uh, Commissioner Olhausen is saying, we should think of the topology as endogenous. That is, you don't decide in a vacuum what your interconnection price is going to be. You're going to say, as opposed to my alternative of building a CDN, or as an alternative of a direct connection versus indirect connections. And uh, once you start doing that, it becomes a much richer space. And what you realize is that, in fact, this is just a bargain looking at different prices. And I understand everyone would like a cheaper price. And if the government, some people are willing to say, if the government gets you a little bit more, it's great. Uh, I discover usually when that happens that that broom always sweeps both ways. Is that pretty soon you're going to have a price you want to move and you're not going to be able to do it? There is the, the general question of, uh, I mean, we can't, speak, we can't speak simply of which system, because obviously uh, anything that happens and what's happening now is a mixture of systems. But I guess you, you still can pose the question of whether the pure competition, the focus on competition or the focus on regulation, uh, is more, to which, which of them, uh, as a practical institutional matter, uh, invites more rent-seeking than the other? And to what extent mm -hmm. can one work out trade-offs between the two systems which minimize rent-seeking? And, and so I, I don't know, I'd be interested in anyone's reflections on that. Well, looking at public choice theory, um, when you think about um, an agency like the Federal Trade Commission or the Department of Justice that's not an industry-specific regulator, um, typically they're, har they're harder to capture because who's going to invest the resources to capture them because they're only looking at your conduct or your deals every, every now and then. Um, I, by comparison, I think when you have an industry-specific regulator who is looking at this industry and making a lot of decisions about a very discrete set of players, uh, the ability to uh, try to engage in rent seeking and uh, tilt the playing field in your favor and raise your rival's costs, I think, is, is probably a lot more um, beneficial a strategy for, uh, for an industry to, to engage in. Gene, did you want to say something? Well, I, that's, um, uh, so from a perspective of captured agency concerns, I can fully understand that. From a perspective of expertise, I can just say that as much as I think the Department of Justice, Antitrust Division lawyers and economists are brilliant, um, they often feel like they have to defer to FCC expertise in certain areas because, uh, because they do so much in so many realms that they can't necessarily keep up with the details. Um, I think also it's not just rent seeking in, in a traditional um, uh, analysis. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a whole ecosystem. So if I get away from the, the, the Windows Update example, I, but I get into a question of uh, consumer inconvenience and problems of interoperability. Those are things that are not very good antitrust issues often. Um, they're not pure market foreclosures. It doesn't have to be a monopolist or, or a dominant player, but it can be enormous um, drag on the economy and, and harm to consumers that is short of an antitrust violation. Well, if you have an, a, an expert agency that cares about that and has a mandate to look at that, you might be able to deal with that problem and actually augment competition, but it's not necessarily an antitrust issue. So there, there are different issues that need to be addressed in this competitive um, analysis. And, and, um, and, and then just even example, in this example, you use a paid prioritization. Well, you just mixed interconnection and paid prioritization. And frankly, um, I don't know what the president meant, but even with what the president said, um, all of the interconnection companies don't think it addressed their issues of what they're paying for CDNs or direct transit or direct connection. So you have to look at a, at a picture of this because it's a very complicated um, infrastructure uh, uh, um, issue as to what, it, what would be equal and what wouldn't be equal. And my sense is many of the things you described, Chris, would not be touched as requiring equal payment or treatment. 
um, uh, uh, but it's a much narrower set of, of issues where there's a terminating monopoly problem that at least will need to be looked at um, uh, with the president weighing in with one particular approach. Well, in, so in answer to the j judge your specific question, which is even there are issues that the SEC deals with that are not competition issues. I think Gene's absolutely right. I mean, the one that I think is the most important right now is spectrum policy. You know, that is a, an allocative decision and fighting with the Department of Defense and working with that process to try to get more warehouse spectrum into play, I think, is in the best interest of the country. And I think that I hope the FCC uh, can spend more time doing that. Um, if you, you want... An auction if you want to play. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I got a little change, you know, we'll see what we can do. But um, the other thing is, I will say that the Europe did have, one le place that did have an aspiration of relying entirely on competition policies, Europe. They said, once we get these markets a certain way, sector-specific uh, regulation will disappear. They no longer really have that as a realistic aspiration. Uh, they don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. So, I mean, um, even after they blot about all their competition, they just don't think it's possible. And so I do think that um, it may happen someday, but no one's expecting to happen soon. Regarding the... Do me just do sure, please. Why have the Europeans uh, given up on abandonment of sector-specific regulation? Well, so I have a, a lot of weird opinions about this. You have to understand, Europe is so screwed up, it's unbelievable. Um, <laughs> The government still owns 30, a third of Deutsche Telekom and Orange, and um, they are very, they're not very interested in liberalization. Uh, there's this whole world about a single market they talk, keep talking about, they keep paying this rhetoric. They don't really want a single market, because what a single market means is that someday a foreign company is going to take your customers away. And, uh, you know, I think about, when I think about a single market, to me I think about the merger of East and West Germany, we saw a whole bunch of companies and employment and dislocation in East Germany go bankrupt because they weren't, the single market means you've got to compete with the rest of the Europe. And I think when they look at what that really means, they flinch. And so they have this huge gap between what they think of as a valid competition policy when and what they actually do. And part of it is because of the political concerns of not wanting to cause those dislocations, and part of it is just plain flat money. That, um, the, I was talking to essentially the number two person in the German version of the FCC, and the, number, the, the lead position with the chairmanship was vacant, so the vice chair was essentially acting. And they had this whole explanation about how they divide the stock ownership in the Ministry of Finance, which is separate, and they put all these walls. But she just said, yeah, but the government does like getting a, a big fat dividend every month. And the best way to preserve Deutsche Telekom's dividend is to stop competition. I mean, I'm, there is a deep ambivalence they have that is just dra based on the structure of their, mar of their industry that's putting a huge drag on them. And it drives me crazy. <laughs> um, and, but, you know, it's one of these things where I think that there's some positive things we can do. You know, on the interconnection point, I actually think it's, it's quite complicated. Um, you know, when we saw uh, Netflix change providers, and Netflix is one-third of the Internet, as we know, all our peering arrangements are assumed on some notion of, of balance and reciprocity. When you sign up one-third of the internet, what used to be a peering arrangement, you shouldn't expect to still be a peering arrangement, you should start paying money. And that's the way the contracts are usually written. And what's fascinating to me is that was an endogenous choice, is they used to be with Verizon, they used to be with a bunch of other places, they paid them more, but they got the service, and there was never a problem. I think they're looking for a bargain. And uh, um, they gambled, and, and when eventually they've now cutting direct deals. I think it's growing. Someone's going to pay for it. Who's going to pay for it? My answer, probably both. <laughs> you know, they both derive value for it, and what the actual allocation between the two parties should be the subject of negotiation. There is a tendency to look at the edge providers at the mercy of the network providers. Um, David Clark of MIT, just by coincidence, happened to be running trace, net, uh, trace route studies of the connection between Netflix and Comcast at the time the agreement went down. And what was fascinating is there are three transit providers in the Comcast, and Netflix clearly moved its traffic among them on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, completely congested one transit provider. It was Tata and then Verizon, and I can't remember who the third one was. And so the notion that the edge provider doesn't have tools at its capability, people talk about network providers, oh, they could find traffic and block it and do this other stuff. The, both sides are fairly nimble here. And they are, in a lot of ways, positioned to defend themselves. And any regulator, this is happening in real time. A regulator coming to clean up this mess after the fact is going to have a very, very hard time doing that. 
And so the idea that um, there's these large enterprise players who are at the mercy of the net providers, I think overstates the position a bit. I think that they're in an excellent position to bargain. And in fact, my hope is that they will, that they, no one buys an internet connection for its own sake. They're partners, they're channel partners. They should look at how they should grow the pie. That's the repeat play business instead of, and come to a division of allocation that'll hold for the long run. Um, that's my optimistic view. I don't see great reason for optimism in the short run. <laughs> Gene, I always love pairing on panels with you. You're thoughtful and engaged, and I get tired of the bumper sticker you know, conversations. Well, I am too. The policy fight is just trends towards rhetoric and exaggeration, and uh, it's fun to be able to bring it more into uh, kind of what are we really disputing, what are we really disagreeing with. I hope so. Uh, we'll see how this works. Were you surprised? Yeah, yeah. I thought there was really only a 5% chance that the White House was going to respond. Um, well, that, yeah. But I have to say, too, I 